Okay, we are all set. Uh, let's begin with Second Chronicles today. Yesterday we looked at uh, First Chronicles. We saw that Chronicles tends to focus more on the religious history, whereas uh, we had First Kings and Second Kings and Second Samuel, which dealt more with the political history. So uh, there are many religious aspects that are emphasized in Chronicles, uh, which is what we noticed last time. We also saw that. Uh, first Chronicles was kind of similar to Second Samuel because it talked about David and uh, his, his rule and all of that. On the other hand, Second Chronicles is more similar to the history of the Judah dynasty, um, which is you know basically First and Second Kings. So you have a repetition of First and Second Kings over here in our second chronicles but there are details mentioned historical facts mentioned which probably were not mentioned in the other larger account and of course here we only have the history of uh, the southern kingdom the judahite dynasty only they are mentioned over here we don't really see any mention of the northern kingdom why mainly because the p they are like we talked yesterday uh, this Chronicles was being written for the people who have come back and almost everyone who has come back. They all belong to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So for them, the ma their main, of, main interest would be the southern kingdom. They would not be that much concerned about the history of the northern kings. So in Second Chronicles, you mainly have um, a description of Solomon's rule and all, all the other kings who followed him, who belonged to the Davidic dynasty. So uh, who would be our key personalities? Uh, we have Solomon and we have uh, Queen of Sheba who's mentioned. Um, this, of course, Jehoshaphat, uh, Uzziah, Hezekiah, Manasseh, who know who repents, uh, Josiah, all of these um, important kings are mentioned here in Second Chronicles. Coming to the structure of the book, we could maybe basically divide it into two main parts, uh, chapters 1 to 9 talk about Solomon, his wisdom, the construction work that he did, all of that. Then chapters 10 to 36 gives us a uh, history of the 20 kings who ruled in the southern dynasty. Okay, so there were a total of 20 kings, all of them descendants of David. And um, I think the next point is mentioned in your textbook, where it talks about the spiritual reformations. Uh, I think it's there in your textbook where it talks about how there are one, two, three, four, five uh, spiritual revivals that are discussed. Asas, uh, the, the revival that takes place in the time of Asa. Then you have Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah. During these kings, during the time of these kings, there was a, a spiritual reformation and revival because these kings were. They tried to improve the spiritual condition of the people. So we see some of those details. Coming very briefly to the uh, dedication prayer that Solomon makes, you know, when the temple is being dedicated, we didn't we didn't touch upon this when we were looking at our first kings and second kings. So just to very briefly touch upon that, um, in Second Chronicles chapter seven, verses thirty-two to thirty-nine is where uh, you have you know um, the portions that I am trying to bring out. He, of course, begins the prayer by talking about how, Lord, you're too large. Nothing in the earth cannot contain you. He has a doubt, and he doesn't want to answer. Discuss later, no? Please. I know it's just that it distracts me. That's all. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, he says, Lord, you are very great. And even this little temple that we have constructed cannot contain you. Uh, but Lord, you know, you have chosen to um, be among us and we are grateful to that. And so he prays and says, Lord, when we all cry out to you, when we turn towards this temple and we pray, please hear us, please answer our prayers. He prays those things. And then there are some other specific things also that he prays. Um, because you see this prayer is being prayed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so it's interesting to see what are the different specific things that he prays for. So one of the important things that he prays for is Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 32. Maybe we could have someone read out 32 and 30. 
maybe uh, Second Chronicles seven verses thirty two to thirty. Uh, Great, then I got the wrong reference over here. <laughs> um, yeah. So chapter 7 doesn't have any um, verses. Hmm. So you mean I got this from First Chronicles? See if you can get anything in. But First Chronicles wouldn't make sense. Okay, could someone track down the Solomon's prayer of dedication? Um, is it uh, is it not? Okay, Second Chronicles seven, and um, there you're saying there is no verse thirty two in chapter seven, is it? So could we just look for the verses where he talks about um, the prayer for the foreigner, and then after that for those who are led into captivity? Let me actually open my Bible. Others, this will not get resolved. So, <clears throat> mm, okay. Yeah, looks like I've gone put the wrong reference. All right, I'll just read out the verses. Um, though I seem to have my reference wrong. Okay, uh, Solomon, this is what he prays in his prayer of dedication. Um, maybe it's taken from Kings then in that case. All right, he, this is the prayer that he prays. He says, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven. Okay, so in his uh, prayer of dedication that he is praying, he not only prays that the Lord would answer the, uh, the prayers which they are offering as God's people, but he even includes the foreigner in his prayer. And he says, when they come from a distant land and they have come all the way over here to pray to Yahweh specifically because they have heard about the greatness of his name and his mighty hand. And uh, so when they do that, uh, he prays, he says, Lord, you know, uh, he says in verse uh, 33 of, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that act of kindness. Second Chronicles, um, Chapter six is supposed to work. <laughs> if yeah, Second Chronicles chapter six, verse um, thirty, yeah, thirty-two, and then thirty-three. He says, "Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you." Okay, so um, he he says. Um, even though they are outsiders, because they have believed in your great name, because they have come over here to see your work, do what they are asking of you. And this is a, something that would have really uh, touched God's heart. Because later on, if you remember, you know, in our New Testament, the Lord Jesus is very angry when uh, the space which has been reserved for the Gentiles is being used as a marketplace. And he says, this is a house of prayer. This is a place where people come from distant lands to pray to the living God, to have their needs met. And uh, instead of allowing these people to come and stand over here after traveling such a long distance and you know placing their petitions before God, instead of allowing them to do that, you turn this into a marketplace. And you have no respect for these people who have come from such a great distance you know, in, uh, to place their faith in the living God. So for God, this was very, very important. And so we have that aspect of uh, the of, of God's heart being brought out in these verses. And then later on, when we move to verses 36 uh, to 39, it talks about how he says, 
you know lord please continue to hear us and answer us even when we have sinned so badly that we are led away into captivity okay so um uh, maybe we could just read verses uh, 38 and 39 if someone could read out please Okay, so again over here, he's talking about many, many years from the time of his rule, you know, when people would have gone into sin to such an extent that God's punishment would come upon them and they would be taken away as captive. And he says, Lord, when they're living in that land out there, in the land of captivity, and they repent of their attitude and they turn towards your temple and they pray, hear them. And he says, please forgive your people who have sinned against you. So all these things that are coming out of his mouth in his prayer, they are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a random prayer, but he's talking about things which are dear to the heart of God. So, you know, you could actually go through this um, uh, prayer of dedication uh, in detail, you know, during your quiet time, during your devotions and look at how he prays what points he prays for because all of those prayer points are points which god really cared about and god wanted to answer those prayer points because when solomon finishes praying this is what happens and i think now we have come to second chronicles chapter 7 verses 1 to 3 uh, so sorry for that for wasting time um, so Coming into Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, Solomon finishes praying. And this is how the Lord confirms that he has approved of the prayer. And now he wants to fulfill what has been prayed for. And so you have fire coming down from heaven. And the burnt offering which has been placed before the Lord, it gets burnt on its own. So nobody lights the fire. God himself lights the fire from above and confirms that this prayer is in line with his will and he will indeed glorify himself through this temple. And it goes on to say that the glory of the Lord filled the temple to such an extent that uh, uh, nobody could even go inside and everyone just kneels down with their pavement uh, on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worship him. So uh, this is uh, one important thing that maybe we should you know, remember from Second Chronicles. Another nice thing that we see in Second Chronicles uh, is to be found in chapter 11. I really hope I got my reference right this time. Second Chronicles 11, 13 to 17, if someone could please read out, uh, because it talks about people who love the Lord and look at the decision that they are taking for the Lord. Okay, so those who are online can just follow in your Bibles. Second Chronicles chapter 11, 13 to 17. Yeah, I think that should be enough up to verse 16. Um, so uh, we looked in Kings at how Jeroboam decides to set up an alternate mode of worship so that people will no longer come to Jerusalem and get influenced by Jerusalem. And uh, so all the priests and Levites who are there in the northern kingdom are kind of out of work. Because up to now, they used to, you know, um, minister to Yahweh. But now, uh, you know, this Jeroboam does no longer needs them because he has come up with a pagan form of worship. And he has appointed his own uh, people who will be willing to participate in that kind of a worship. So he has a new set of high priests and priests. And so these people, they could have continued staying over there because you see the land which was allotted for their families was out there in the northern kingdom. 
if they leave that and come over here there's nothing much for them over here in the southern kingdom but it says so beautifully over here uh, in uh, verse 14 the levites even abandoned their pasture lands and property and came to judah because you see they wanted to serve the living god they were willing to give up everything and come over here and whatever people are willing to give them out of mercy and kindness they're willing to accept that and live with their entire families it's not just one man coming down over here they're coming down with their entire household knowing that here there is no land allotted for them that shows the level of their commitment you know because today we are we believers are supposed to be a kingdom of priests so this is the attitude that we should have way for us it is important the first priority is to honor god and serve him and if material benefits come along fine but if there are no benefits even then are we willing to take a stand and say yes i will go to wherever i have to go and i will do whatever is required because i i'd rather be over there and have less financial gain than be over here and just continue to enjoy and not fulfill god's purposes you know so for them their priorities were so important and they set an example for the rest of the people so when you have this large number of people maybe you know hundreds of priests and levites taking their families and moving to the southern kingdom the rest of the people who are watching they think oh look at them they've left their land and they have gone over there maybe we too should follow their example and then you have this lovely verse over here in verse 16 where it says those from every tribe of israel who set their hearts on seeking the lord they decide that they too will move to the south so we see a beautiful act of devotion and commitment and um, not sure exactly what happened to those families but you know god would have blessed their descendants because of this act of loyalty that they have shown to the Lord, the Lord would have blessed those families and the descendants of those families. Uh, so um, we see that admirable thing over here. So while there are some very nice things happening, uh, you know, in um, the Second Chronicles account, uh, we also see some negative, painful things. And um, maybe we should dwell upon one of those uh, for the simple reason that, you know, uh, we cannot really get through Kings and Chronicles without at least talking a little bit about Ahab. Uh, he's one of the uh, main villains and uh, we would have to kind of look at a little bit at his story. Um, so we have Jehoshaphat of Judah, a godly king uh, who makes a very ungodly decision. He decides to get into a partnership with Ahab. Now those details are not mentioned over here in our Chronicles, but um, you know, later on, there are details mentioned in Chronicles and the background of that you will find in First and Second Kings. So we would kind of have to touch upon that background to get a clearer picture of what is happening over here in Second Chronicles. So Jehoshaphat, a godly king, decides to enter into a ungodly partnership with Ahab of northern Israel. And so he goes to Ahab. And, um, you know, you have that at the end of, um, I think it was Second Kings, or was it First Kings, <laughs> where it talks about, uh, no, it has to be Second Kings, uh, where it talks about, you know, how they both get into a partnership and they try to go and fight um, a, a battle uh, to get back Ramoth Gilead, I think. And then it does not work. Uh, and Ahab, in fact, gets killed over there. So anyway, the point is that Jehoshaphat tries to enter into an ungodly partnership with Ahab. And Ahab suggests and says, we should strengthen this partnership with a marriage alliance. And so Jehoshaphat, the godly king of Judah, he has many sons. And the crown prince, the one who is going to be ascending the throne after him, that would be... Um, Jehoram. So Jehoram is one of the important sons that Jehoshaphat has, has, and he has one more son, Jehu. This son, Jehu, he decides to leave the southern kingdom. He decides to go to the northern kingdom and start serving Ahab as one of his commanders in his army. So these are the two important characters that you need to know about Jehoshaphat as two main important sons, Jehoram, the crown prince, 
and the other son is Jehu, who is um, not the crown prince, but he makes a choice to leave his father's kingdom, go to Ahab's kingdom, and start serving as a commander in Ahab's army. So when Ahab suggests a marriage alliance, Jehoshaphat, in his foolishness, decides to give his crown prince, his son, in marriage to um, a daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Ahab and Jezebel being the kind of characters that they are, you can just imagine what kind of a person their daughter is. Quite a scary character named Ataliah. So Jehoram marries Ataliah, and Ataliah moves into the southern kingdom. And um, uh, they have a child. Uh, the, the, son, the son that they give birth to is somebody named Ahaziah. So when after Jehoram dies, the person who comes to the throne of Judah is Ahaziah, Ahaziah being the son, uh, the, the son of uh, Ataliah and Jehoram. Now in the northern kingdom, you have another son of Ahab, Joram, who comes to the throne. So here in the south, you have Ahaziah, and there in the north, you have Joram who has, ascends. Now coming back to the other son that we talked about, Jehu, this is the word of the Lord which comes to Jehu. Um, Jehu is not a good person, not a godly person. Uh, he is involved in Id idol worship, but God chooses to use him. And so Elisha comes to Jehu and he says, you know, if you are willing to bring God's judgment upon the house of Ahab and wipe out all of his descendants, then God says that he will make you the king in northern Israel itself. So Jehu is very attracted by the offer. And so he decides that he will bring judgment upon Ahab's family. So the first thing which he does is he um, kills Joram, who is the king in, in Israel. And then he goes to uh, Judah, where you have Ahaziah on the throne, and Ahaziah is also killed. So Jehu kills the two, he kills the northern king, and he kills the southern king, and Jezebel is still alive. So the next step is for him to go and deal with Jezebel. And uh, so in 2 Kings, you have that story, 2 Kings chapter 9, where it talks about how uh, Jehu goes to Jezebel's palace, and she's watching over there from the window, from an upstairs window. Uh, even as he arrives and she, you know, she calls down to him and she speaks very angrily. And the people who are supposed to be attending to her, her attendants, the eunuchs who are supposed to be her servants, her attenders, they hate her so much that they voluntarily throw her out of the window and, you know, she falls down to the ground below and she is killed. And uh, before they can collect her body, the dogs eat her flesh just as God had prophesied. So um, we see that terrible story, you know, enacted. And um, so the northern kingdom, Joram has been murdered. And in the southern kingdom, Ahaziah has been murdered. His mother, Ataliah, instead of feeling very sad that her son has been murdered, what does she do? She thinks, okay, let's add to this whole murder story. She decides to kill all of the sons of, her, of Ahaziah her grandchildren, and of course, you know, um, uh, the other concubines and their children, of course, would have been involved. But the thing is, among the people that she murders, they would have been even her own grandchildren. She wipes out all of them because she thinks, now is a chance for me to sit on the throne. Now that my son is dead, I can sit on the throne. Such an evil human being. So she kills her own grandchildren, and she uh, rises to the throne. but she has a daughter, Ahaziah's sister, who somehow has not been influenced by all the evil in the family because she marries a godly priest. And so when she sees the murders which are taking place, Atalaya has ordered that all the sons of Ahaziah should be murdered. She tries to save the last child, which is still a one-year-old baby at that time. So she quickly takes hold of uh, one-year-old uh, Josiah and she hides him in the temple. You know, um, the temple at that time was like a huge temple complex because you would have, of course, the main courtyard and then you have the holy place and the most holy place. But 
around that you would have all these store rooms where you know you have the uh, the grain offerings being stored you would have some quarters where you have the priests actually living over there the ones who are looking after then you would have a place where you would have the guards you know who are guarding they would be staying over there in, in the guard rooms so you have an entire large complex built around the main temple uh, so uh, somewhere in that temple complex this baby is hidden and that is where josiah grows up so basically um, this sister her name is jehosha bia my pronunciation is bad but um, she's a good good woman she and her husband they bring up this little uh, boy and uh, finally when he is 6 years old they decide to you know formally anoint him as the king and so um in um second chronicles 23 jehoiada he calls all the captains uh, of uh, of the of the army and he calls the important levites and priests and he tells them you know what this one descendant of ahaziah who is still alive and he has to be now placed on the throne will you support me if i try to coronate him as king will you support me and you know help me in doing this and they all agree they give in fact they give their word in second chronicles chapter 23 um verse great perfect i have not written down the verse was one and two yes ah uh, yeah they 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 are the soldiers and the people agreed under oath to provide protection and support and so um you know with the support of the um of the armed guard they coronate this uh, young child as the next king and athaliah when she hears all the celebration going on she quickly comes comes running over there to the temple and she is horrified to see that you know this child is not dead and he has been uh, appointed as the new king and then jehoiada gives a command and says you know drag her out and execute her so they drag her out from there and they execute her near the horse gate on the palace grounds all that is found in second chronicles chapter 23 and then jehoiada asks the king that little 6 year old and all the people to formally enter into a covenant with the living god and say we are no longer going to be worshiping the baals because you know that's the speciality of ahab and his entire family they're all into uh, baal worship and so now they make a formal a co formal covenant before god and say no longer will we be worshiping the baals but we will once again serve uh, the living god and so the people they go into the temple of baal they kill the chief priest over there and they all rededicate themselves to serving the living god and that is when jehoiada uh he does a lot of repair work on the temple okay so the lot of repair work is done to improve the condition of the temple because over the years nobody has even bothered to take care of the temple of god and so all of that is done and the sad thing is that once jehoiada grows old and he dies and he is no longer there to advise josiah josiah in his stupidity and his foolishness and his sinfulness he goes back into idol worship it's such a sad thing i mean imagine his life was saved in such a miraculous way he was placed on the throne in in such a dramatic manner um he lived under a godly uh, stepfather who looked after him brought him up did so much for him and now sadly he goes back into uh, idol worship and then one of the sons of jehoiada you know zechariah so basically zechariah and josiah would have grown up together you know because after all jehoiada and his wife brought up this boy so he would have known zechariah personally and zechariah rises up and he says what you have done is not agreeable the lord does not approve and the lord will punish you so in second chronicles chapter 24 verse maybe we can actually read out this particular passage second chronicles chapter 24 verses 20 to 25 if someone could read out please
Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's um, let it's all right. Um, so we see basically that uh, even after all the love that Joash has received, he's not grateful, and uh, so um, he murders Zechariah right there in the courtyard of the Lord, even as Zechariah is delivering the prophecy and saying, you know, the Lord will punish you because you have gone into idolatry. Um, he is they plot against him and they murder him there in the courtyard and even as Zechariah is dying he says may the Lord see this and call you to account may the Lord judge you for what you have done and so just as uh, you know uh, Zechariah has uh, you know cried out and made this pronouncement later on you have the army the Aramean army coming over there and Jeho and Joash is very badly wounded in the battle. Uh, that would be in verse 25. Um, yeah, Second Chronicles chapter 24, verse 25. He's very badly wounded in the battle. He's brought back home in a wounded condition. And as he's lying over there helpless, he is assassinated. He's killed. And that's the end of that man. Uh, so Joash. Uh, even though he could have had a very different story, he makes a wrong choice. So which means as long as Jehoiada was alive, he was listening to good advice. But in his heart of hearts, maybe there was no real commitment, no real change. Now watch out. This can happen to us. You know, as long as there's a godly influence upon us, you know, as long as we are here in the Bible college, as long as we have teachers, you know, uh, talking to us, influencing us, you know, uh, speaking words into us, we stay strong. But are we really building ourselves up in the inner man, in our own personal walk with God? If that is not happening, once you go away from the Bible college and no longer have these influences, you know, from the outside holding you up, you may not have the strength on the inside to continue standing. You may get easily led away. So it is good to be in a godly atmosphere where you are being built up, where you're constantly being reminded of the things of God. And uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the love and the devotion that all these you know, people that are under whom you are, you look at their love and their devotion, you catch their passion, you catch that enthusiasm and you're on fire. But if you have not done your own building up on the inside, building your personal relationship with him, once you go out of that atmosphere, all that passion, all that enthusiasm, it's no longer there. There's nothing from outside, um, you know, stirring you up. Now, are you carrying the fire on the inside? If it is there, then it doesn't matter how it is on the outside. You'll continue to be on fire. But if on the inside you have not built yourself up, you will fizzle out. You know, and there's a great danger that can happen to us. So we need to be very careful that we will not end up uh, as Joe Ashes in our in our own personal lives. Um, as I have been, you know, talking about these things, if I have made any mistake in mixing up Joash and Josiah's name, very, very sorry. Because sometimes when I'm talking, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, so okay, Joash is the one that we were talking about now. Now we come to the other guy, the good person. Okay, Josiah, the, the good, the good king, the one who you know does not um, um, get into uh, murder and all of that so this josiah is somebody who comes later on um during the time of hezekiah is when the northern kingdom is finally taken away by the assyrians okay so the assyrians they come and they conquer northern israel they take away the people all the 10 tribes they take them away as captives when does all of that happen it happens when hezekiah is ruling in the south so during that time is when the Assyrian um, you know, army comes and invades. So after Hezekiah, you have Manasseh, you know, the really, really terrible king, the one who would take all his sons to the, what is that, to the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Yeah, that is basically where he would he used to take his children and sacrifice them over there to the pagan gods, one of the most evil kings. And then, you know, we talked about how he repents. 
a genuine repentance. So uh, Hezekiah's son would be Manasseh, and uh, Manasseh's son, Amon, continues to be evil. But Amon's uh, son, Josiah, he chooses to be a godly king. So basically, that's how the lineage comes. You have Hezekiah's son, uh, Manasseh, who repents. But his son, Amon, does not repent. However, uh, after Amon is assassinated, his eight-year-old son, because the father gets assassinated, they put the eight-year-old boy on the throne. Um, how, how old would an eight-year-old boy be? I mean, in our you know, current terms, eight-year-old would be like, what, third standard? You know, so you basically have a third standard kid sitting on the throne, but this is no ordinary eighth, uh, third standard kid because we see in Second Chronicles chapter 34, in the eighth year of his you know uh, reign, um, so if he came to the throne um, at the age of eight. Uh, then maybe that would make it 16 years, is it? In the eighth year of his reign, he began to seek the God of his father, David. So in uh, from a young age, he begins to seek the Lord. He builds himself up on the inside. Joash didn't have any strength on the inside. He was just being influenced from outside. But on the inside, no personal strong relationship with Yahweh. On the other hand, here you have a young man, Josiah, who has taken the effort to seek the God of his father, David, it says over here. So he is on the inside. He is strong. He has built himself up. And uh, in the 12th year of his rule, he decides to get rid of any of the idol worships, uh, you know, places which are still there. And so he goes through his land and he takes down, he tears down all of those Asherah poles and all of those idols. Um, and not only that, he also goes into the Israelite, northern Israelite territory. Because anyway, now technically that, that territory has come to them. You know, because now no longer do you have a northern king over there. So um, you have uh, basically some people who have been set up over there by the Assyrians to take care of the admin and all of that. But he sends people even into the northern kingdom. You know, Josiah sends people into the northern kingdom to tear down the temples even over there. Because his desire is not only to bring about a revival here in Judah itself, he even wants to bring about a revival in the northern land also. So that is what we see in Second Chronicles chapter 34, um, verse 6, where it says, In the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them, he tears down all the altars. So here is a man who really wants to bring about a revival and renewal. And then in the 18th year of his rule, that is when he begins to um, do further repair work and reconstruction work on the temple. So while that repair work is going on, they find a book of the law of the Lord. That, that is in uh, verse 14. Um, Maybe we could read out Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 14, 15. Yeah, maybe 14 and 15 if you could read out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we basically see that they discover a copy, a written copy, which has come down from Moses' times. And now the uh, Shafan, the scribe, he reads out what is there in the book of the law. He reads it out to Josiah. And when Josiah hears about it, it says in verse 19, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes because in his heart, Whatever he little bit he knew, he was developing his relationship with God. He, he wanted to be sincere and faithful. He even tore down all the temples which were there, you know, uh, which were dedicated to the Asherahs and the Baals and all of that. But he didn't really have the written word of God. 
So now he gets to know that there is a scroll in which all the details are given about how they should be living. And when he reads that, he thinks, oh my goodness, I've done so much, but what I have done is not enough. There are so many commandments that I have not even kept. He is so horrified. He says he tears his robes and he immediately sends a messenger to the prophetess Hulda to find out what is God going to say about this. And Hulda, this is the prophecy that she gives in verses 23, 24, up to, maybe we could read out verses 24 to 27. Hmm. Yes, so the Lord says, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God when you heard of what he spoke against this place, therefore, the Lord says, you know, you will not, uh, during your time, all of this judgment will not take place. It will happen later. So um, Josiah, from the beginning, he shows a heart that is responsive and he humbles himself before God. So when correction comes to us, when God points out something in us that uh, he is not pleased with, when he points out our defects and our sins, do we choose to be responsive and humble ourselves and, and admit and say, yes, Lord, this particular thing which you are pointing out is wrong. It is sinful in your eyes. So that is a response which really pleases God. He wants a heart which will say, admit and say, yes, what you are saying is correct and what I am doing is definitely sinful. So Josiah takes up that attitude and so God says, I will not allow the judgment to come during your time, but it will take place later. Uh, anyone wants to say anything, ask any questions? Uh, no. Francis is definitely has no questions. Yeah. No, he's like very determined saying no. So, yeah. Okay, so... Um, we, I'll just look, you know, talk about the three stages in which you know Nebuchadnezzar takes away the, um, you know, the captives. So it happens in three batches. Now this may be in your textbook. I'm not sure. Probably is there in your textbook. So in the first 605 BC is when he takes away the first batch of people. So at that time you have Jehoiakim being taken away, and even Daniel and his friends are all taken during the first batch. Second batch is 597 BC when you have Jehoiakim being taken away. And at that time, you have Ezekiel also being uh, led away. The third batch, the final batch, is something which the people bring upon their own heads because Zedekiah has been appointed and he has been told to kindly be loyal and listen to what the king is saying. And even Jeremiah tells him, please follow the whatever the orders have been given by Nebuchadnezzar because God is bringing this punishment upon your head and you better accept it because of the way you people have lived, the choices you have made, God is now bringing judgment. So don't try to avoid the judgment, accept it and allow yourself to be submissive to Nebuchadnezzar. But what does Zedekiah do? He says, no, 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 I want to make a partnership with Egypt. And so when Nebuchadnezzar gets to know that these people are making a partnership with Egypt, he comes he destroys the city, he destroys the temple, and he takes away whoever is left. And we ask the, uh, and uh, some of them try to escape and, they, and run off to Egypt. Those who are trying to run away to Egypt, they also drag Jeremiah along with them. So in fact, Jeremiah dies in Egypt, not in his own land. Um, so all of those things take place. So these are some of the... Uh, so over the last few weeks, from the time we started Samuel, I 
try to bring out the main historical stories that we should be aware of. Now, there are many, many other stories as well. But I try to bring out the main important ones that generally people who say that they are Bible college students are familiar with. Okay, So these are the main stories. Um, so uh, now beyond that, uh, in your own time, if you can go through these books and become familiar with the rest of the stories, uh, that would be you know good. Um, because why it says in uh, Second Timothy three sixteen, why have all these stories been put over there? Not for entertainment, but to you know uh, to correct us, to rebuke us, to inspire us, you know, to teach us, and so we need to learn. All right. So um, there are no questions. And in that case, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for all these historical records that you have recorded for us so that we can learn from them. And we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, we would be like uh, Josiah, who built himself in the inner man. He strengthened himself in the Lord. He did not even have the written word, O oh Lord, but uh, at his own level, he tried to reach out to you. And I pray, Lord, that we would have the same attitude as Josiah. Let us not be shallow like Joash, who as long as things were good and godly around him, the atmosphere was godly, he, can't, he chose to be godly. But the minute that atmosphere went away, there was nothing on the inside and he drifted away. Lord, I pray that we would not be like that. So help us, O Lord, to be like Josiah rather than Joash. Thank you, Lord, that you are working in each of our lives and using all of these lessons to, uh, to talk to us, remind us of your truths, and build us up on the inside. Thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. And those of you online, thank you so much for paying attention.